All right, Jason, Jason Gale, TANS content manager. Uh, thanks for being here and you're gonna help us explain the catechism explained. Yeah. So uh, anyway, so let's let's just dive right in. First of all, before we get to the the book itself, which I think is amazing, and I'm so excited as the publisher to finally have gotten this because it's been a work and, and long time in coming. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about uh, your background as a catechist because you got about as much street cred as <laughs> uh, a catechist can have. So kind of tell us about that. Sure. So um, I wasn't always interested in catechesis. Uh, I, uh, I was catechized in the 80s, so as you can imagine, I was probably poorly catechized, except for my, my own uh, parents, uh, who did a great job. And you're still a Catholic. Um, and I'm incredible. still a Catholic. That's incredible. That's amazing. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, I was a, a Ford mechanic before this, and I decided to go back to school to study theology, and I really got interested into uh, catechetics and the history of just figuring out what went wrong, you know, and so that really piqued my interest uh, and it got me diving into different theories of, of, of catechetics, uh, the, particularly the modern history of, of what, what went wrong um, shortly after the council, was it better before the council, you know, diving into all these uh, interesting questions uh, and it led me to get, you know, a degree in catechetics and then further I went on and got a, an ecclesiastical license uh, with a specialty in catechetics. So uh, this is very much uh, uh, in my field of expertise, and I'm very excited that uh, that Tan uh, has put this book out because I think from, and again, the majority of my experiences has been in catechesis. And, and we make that distinction between theology that, you know, catechesis really, it dives into explaining the faith and helping others to to have a mental grasp of it, to be able to understand it and to live it. Uh, whereas, you know, theology, it dives into all the, the, the hows and, and whys and things like that, whereas catechesis is, is much more foundational. Um, but it also involves, you know, educational theory and things like that. And so uh, for me, diving into this one was, was particularly exciting because of what it is and especially also, you know, the little we do know about uh, Father Spirago is uh, inspirational because he was very much uh, a catechist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So why don't you tell us about uh, S Father Sparago himself, kind of his uh, his personality and kind of his background, because I, th I think it, it seems to bear fruit in this work. Yeah. So we, we don't know a whole lot about it. We have some um, some stories out there, some anecdotes. And for and I think our audience will be surprised for a guy who, again, according to the anecdotes, for a guy who hated to be boring and always tried to, uh, and always wanted to give lively presentations and teachings, he wrote a massive book, right? I mean, that's... <laughs> it's, it's massive. It's, it is massive. It is. I think it's the, I think it's the, uh, the largest one that Tan publishes now. Um, but he wrote several types of catechisms, uh, and he was even uh, championed as a pioneer uh, of popular catechesis. So again, we're talking, you know, uh, the, this is like 1800s. Yeah, yeah, eight, yeah. He he died in 1942, born 1862. So right at the turn of the century, he wrote this in 1899. And so um, uh, again, for 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 a guy whose whose heart was a pastor and he really wanted to help people come to an understanding of the faith, um, he wrote a massive book. Um, and the the title, the Catechism Explained, the title he's referring to uh, is the Roman Catechism. And so while he doesn't really have references throughout it as saying, I'm getting this from, and when we say the Roman Catechism, we're talking about the Catechism of the Council of Trent. Um, he's explaining this. Um, and that was really the, the primary catechism that people were referring to back then. Yeah. And for whatever catechesis, I guess they had, people were reading that. And yeah. So he's like, hey, that's a little tough to read. Let's make that more applicable and useful and easy to understand, right? I mean, that's, right. That, that was the inspiration for this book. Right, and he wrote it for, for three primary reasons. So, I mean, the first was to be a source book for preaching, which uh, uh, even the modern catechism says, you know, preaching is a, it's a privileged place for catechesis. Uh, and so for the, for the pastor, uh, uh, he wrote this for, to, to be able to put a lot of the ideas that were in Trent. And even when you, when you look at the, the catechism of the Council of Trent, uh, many times it'll say, the pastor ought to say this. The pastor kind of ought to teach this aspect. Uh, so it's so it's very much written for the pastor. But he also writes it for the catechist. 
So for the uh, uh, for the lay catechist that is in a classroom, for the lay catechist that is in any other sort of extracurricular group, as many of the, the different methods that were going on during that time, uh, just sort of outside groups, outside of classrooms and things. Uh, so it was written for the, the, the catechist, but also the parent mm. as, and again, as big as it is, as a statement uh, of the faith, um, which is a massive statement um, because the, our, our faith is, is so rich and so valuable and just so, um, uh, it's, it's inexhaustible. And so we can continually study it and uh, try to go from it. Um, one of the other things that I think should be highlighted about the way that Spirago wrote in here was that um, he really stays away from uh, kind of very technical terms. Mm -hmm. He's writing in a very popular manner. So, I mean, while the book itself may be daunting, for those that pick it up and begin to read it, it's it's easy. It's perfectly it's clear. Yeah, that's the amazing yeah. thing is when I was looking through this before we did this new edition and brought it back with some features, which we'll talk about, as I was thumbing through it, saying, man, this is perfectly clear. It's, it's not hard yeah. to read at all like a number of older books written in that time period, maybe archaic language, a little clunky, but nah, this guy was a master at the simplified yeah. language. Yeah, and you could tell that he was, he was, you could tell that he was a pastor uh, in practice, right? He wasn't, uh, he wasn't, you know, a, one of the, like, you know, a priest that never saw the inside of a, a, of a classroom or, uh, you know, taught any catechesis. He himself was very much uh, a catechist and so you, it really comes out in his own, in his own writing. Um, you know, another feature I think of, of, that I think our audience will appreciate with this book is that it's very Christocentric. And even when you look at the organization, you may say, well, it's, it's kind of divided up similarly to the, the other catechism. So with, you know, Trent and, and the, the 92 catechism, you know, we have uh, the creed, the sacraments, morality, and prayer. So it's kind of divided up into those four parts. Um, whereas uh, uh, Spirago, he divides it up into the faith, morals, and the means of grace, which he goes into, he kind of puts together prayers and the sacraments. He kind of puts those together. But the way that it's Christocentric is that it really presents Christ as, in the first part, Christ as teacher of the faith, um, and then it presents Christ when we're talking about morals, Christ in his character of kingship, right? So he's, he rules, uh, and, and, and in a similar way, we're, we're called to uh, rule over ourselves, have, have that self-control, be a king of ourselves first. Uh, and then three, when he gets into the means of grace, you see, you see Christ as high priest. And so in a very beautiful way, he brings together all of the truths of the faith and manages to keep Christ at the center, fulfilling each of these different roles that, that Christ showed us in the Gospels, in his own life. So it's really fascinating how, he, how he's able to kind of bring all of these things together in popular, in kind of popular language, where we're, we're kind of, it, it doesn't have all of the, the, the technicalities uh, and the technical language that sometimes you'll find in, in large theological manuals. Is he saying, let them be anathema, like, <laughs> yeah. like 100 times, like it does in the Council of Trent? Yeah, so no, it's it, uh, sad to some people's dismay, he, he leaves those parts out. We were joking so right before, maybe we could make our own list of anathema and put it as like an appendix <laughs> on the back. We just get to choose who to anathematize yes, or whatever you call it. But anyway, so no, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not antiquated sort of with that language that the Council of Trent is. It's very modernized. But I think yeah. a, a lot of people would like to know, especially those who have this love and appreciation for, for, for tradition, like, yeah. like Tan is so well known for, this is the Council of Trent Catechism explained. That's what it refers to. Right. But, um, and we'll get to, you know, how we've annotated it. But let's, let, let's, let's talk a little bit more about um, how you see this catechism is, is unique. I mean, we've talked about it a little bit, but um, yeah, tell, tell us a little bit more about that, particularly as it relates to the soul, the human soul. Yeah, so one of the things uh, a lot of times kind of a... Uh just kind of a common complaint against catechesis is that they'll say, well, it's, it's dry or all you're doing is trying to give information about Christ. You're not, you're not leading others to Christ. You're not doing things like that. Um, uh, Spirago makes very clear that the aim of this catechism is, is to, to cultivate within the human soul uh, and, and help develop the three powers, uh, the understanding, the affections, and the will to bring them all together. So 
his 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 aim and the whole thing is to is to really form the whole person, which, as opposed to just the understanding. Right, 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 right. Because if it's just like education, if it's just pure theology training, it's really just shaping the mind, the understanding. But right. It's not necessarily forming the person to go put this into into action. Right. Which is where the affections or the appetites and the and the will come in. Yeah. So I mean, a good maybe a good way to understand it is. Uh, um, not every sentence begins in here with the church teaches that because that's very much kind of a you're 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 trying to form somebody's understanding of what the church teaches. It's you know whereas uh, uh, he dives much more into that. Here's a good example of of what he does that that separates it maybe a little from these catechisms, but also shows that he cares deeply about the person that he's catechizing. Um, so if you go to the section towards the end of the um, uh, the creed. So similar to these other catechisms, right? The the first part, uh, 290. 290. Um, or right before, 288. So uh, one of the, like, so like these other catechisms, he begins, uh, he does begin with going through the articles of the creed. Um, but if you look at these other catechisms, the way that they end those sections will be kind of, here's the last article of the creed, and we're done, and now we'll move on to the sacraments, or we'll move on to morality, right? Uh, but Spirago doesn't, again, because he has very much in mind the, the entire human person. And so he ends the part on the creed with talking, he gives this beautiful little treatise on Christian hope, mm. which he doesn't necessarily, you know, in the beginning he does talk about faith even before the creed, which the other catechisms do follow to some extent. But he ends the part on the creed with Christian hope because it is from the faith. The faith stands as the foundation of our hope, right? And the the end of the in the end of our creed, you know, when we talk about the things to come, and so he he ends the section on the faith, talking about the essence of Christian hope. And so he goes into kind of defining it very clearly. And you'll see this when you go through the book as well. Are we've We've organized the material for you in a very uh, beautiful way that the, that I think the reader will be easily, they'll be able to easily navigate. So you're right? talking about the typesetting. Yeah. The, the layout of the book really is beautiful. I mean. Absolutely. Uh, because, I mean, this, this uh, typesetting a book of this size very artistically is, is a big challenge. It, it took is. It a long time. And, you know, scanning an old document that's public domain or whatever and then trying to yeah. Make a beautiful. It takes a lot of work, so we spent yeah. a lot of time and energy really making this a beautiful layout, and I think it. I think it did the job. Absolutely, and very usable because I could sit here in this section on um, on Christian hope, and I can just flip through the three pages, and I can say, here's a definition of Christian hope, and here's kind of three essential points that I need to know in order to understand what the church teaches about Christian hope, and I can do that very quickly. And then, if I need an explanation of any of those points, I can go and read deeper. So it's, it's, it's a very usable text. Uh, uh, and again, because Spirago had in mind the catechist. Um, so the fact that he ends, uh, he doesn't, he doesn't wait until the party says, okay, well, okay, we've talked about the, uh, uh, the articles of the creed, and then we'll, we'll get to the, uh, the, the virtue of hope when we talk about the theological virtues later on in the section on morality. He doesn't do that. He says, no, this, the, the faith that we have just gone through in explaining and understanding the articles of the creed, this is the foundation of our hope, mm -hmm. right? This is why we have hope, and here's how to have hope. So, I mean, when, you, when, you're, when you're looking at this book, you know, I can just imagine somebody that's going through RCIA, they've just gone through the articles of the creed saying, here's what the church believes. Here, here is everything, kind of the entire faith condensed uh, into this this creedal formula, um, and it stands uh, not just as something for my mind to grasp, but uh, uh, hope is primarily uh, uh, an action of the will. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, um, the the creed gives us the 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 object of that hope, which is the life to come, uh, the resurrection of the body. And so we've just covered those. And so Spirago very beautifully goes right into this explanation on hope. So while, you know, you may look at the, the, the contents and you say, okay, well, that's similar to other catechisms. Uh, uh, it's, it's very different in a lot of different ways. And I think in a very beautiful way that I think catechists especially will, will, will enjoy. Well, let's talk about how it kind of fits in between the Council of Trent Catechism and the 92 Catechism. 
because yeah. we've done something quite interesting here to kind of bridge the gap. Yeah, so we're talking about a you know a time period of five hundred years, <laughs> you know, uh, which is which is huge, and you know one of the you know one of the tendencies that I think um, that I think we as Catholics have uh, can be when when something new comes out it repl- it has replaced the old, mm-hmm. so uh, which which I think is a it's a horrible way to do theology. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, it's a horrible way if you've ever tried to to study scripture of just you know saying well it doesn't matter what all these these old dead guys said uh, here's what I think well, no that's not a proper way to study it's not a proper and but for for some reason sometimes we say well the you know we have the the, the Council of Trent but. You know, and, and it has its catechism, but we have the new catechism, which changes everything, which is which is the new standard. We should look at this, you know, in in both uh, its integrity, right? So how does uh, how does the Council of Trent lead to the catechism? Explain, and how does it also shape the foundation of another universal catechism? Um, and so one of the things that Tan's done. That I absolutely love is they've annotated uh, the catechism explained. So again, you have a priest, a catechist, somebody who's a pastor of souls, writing on the catechism of the Council of Trent, explaining it to his flock. And then what we've done is we've also annotated it um, with the 1992 catechism. So that when you as a reader are going through this, you could say, this there's something that might be a little bit different here. I wonder. I wonder if it's the I wonder if it's the same, or I wonder if anything's changed, or how has it changed? How has the wording changed? You'll be able to quickly see how a priest explained the ca- the Catechism of the Council of Trent, and where to go to see how the Church explains it today. Uh, many times you'll find that it's it's a clear reference. You uh, you'll you'll see the that that the ninety two Catechism cl- is clearly going back to Trent. Mm-hmm. Uh, in other places, you, you will see differences. Uh, and you'll also see, um, uh, and, and again, for, for you as the catechist, it, it's good for you to, to understand maybe even some of the development of these things. So ha, ha, has the wording changed or how did they word it before? Um, uh, maybe some parts are unclear, right? So when you're looking at maybe three different texts, you'll be able to get more clarity as to what it says. If you're looking at a, a book that was written for the popular masses, you'll get a little bit different flavor than, you know, both of these are, are can be safely said to be more written as a reference text, right? right. And that's how, uh, and that's how come they're, they're formatted, or at least the, the 92 catechism is formatted the way it is with all the footnotes, side notes, and the references and the margins and things like that. Um, but we've, we've, we've annotated, so every page you'll see at yeah. the bottom. At sometimes, sometimes three or four references to the to the 92 catechism yeah it just shows to me jason what this is showing is the continuity of our faith right i mean that's why i had the idea a long time ago to take this catechism the catechism explained which is a favorite among more traditional catholics yeah but i'm not willing to say ignore the 92 catechism um so i was saying hey how do we bridge this how do we bring right. it together and it's with the references it's with footnotes so basically every page has a couple references to the 92 catechism and it's the continuity of our faith the teachings has not changed yeah but it's it's the i guess the explanation of truths have been evolving yeah. ever since the apostolic age yeah absolutely and and one of the things that that i love is that you'll you'll see even in in certain parts um where even when, say, you know, uh, many times you might see where indulgences have like specific, uh, let's say a specific number of days right. uh, attached to them. Where, you know, if you say this indulgence, uh, 40 years will be knocked off of purgatory, purgatory or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, what, it, what I love about uh, this edition here that we have is that this, in the explanation of, a, of indulgences, it, it explains kind of, that, that temporal allowance that was given to each individual indulgence, right? But then in the footnote, it talks about how uh, uh, Paul VI um, produced an apostolic constitution that eliminated any determination of days or years established with indulgences. Mm. So right here in a, in a beautiful way, and it also gives the catechism reference. So right here in a beautiful way for those that are studying the Catholic faith, they can say, you know, here is how the church explained indulgences. 
it was changed by Paul VI, and here's the catechism reference to, to, to how the church goes through uh, the teaching of indulgences today, or states the, the teaching of indulgences today. So in one text, you can get kind of a, a beautiful development or a beautiful, however you want to, however you want to look at this uh, um, uh, understanding or, or, you know, dive into this aspect of indulgences. Yeah. You can get a, you can, it's a great reference oh, I, uh, I love in it. that way. No, that's a, you're, that's a great example, because if you had either the Council of Trent yeah, you have something that's, in some ways, outdated, and then you have if you have the just the ninety two catechism, you're probably you could be lacking some of the the interesting, yeah, and and in a certain way edifying and important things to know about the way the church handled right. indulgences for so many years. So this is that bridge that brings it together. I just think that this, I think every catechist should have this, and I think yeah. every pastor should have this for his catechizing of his parish, and I think families. Yep. You know, and so mo every family has to have, a, you know, a catechism in their house. And this is a great thing to, when you're talking with your kids or friends and you need to you need to make a quick glance at something. Yeah. You know, this is a great way to do it. And it has a very thorough index yeah, to absolutely. where whatever the topic is, you can flip to that. And, and the table of contents in the beginning, we were joking. It's, it's like a book. It's like 40 pages. Uh, yeah, it's huge. It's huge. And so it's so thorough, so it's super easy yeah. to kind of find what you're looking for. And then you're going to find a very traditional explanation of that yeah. with all the references you need to the 92 Catechism and more. Even, yeah. you know, other things like you, you, you mentioned the indulgences, not just the Catechism, but some other references that help somebody Absolutely. understand how some of these things have evolved or changed over time. Yeah, and, and that's probably one of the things I appreciate so much about this book is Spirago is, is, is so clear with what the church teaches. And, and again, so, so the people that, one of the reasons why I love the Catechism of the Council of Trade is its clarity. clarity. Like it's, it's, it's very firm in its statements. There's no, uh, uh, many of the statements in Trent you can't, um, can't get around. Yeah, you can't. You can't get around. There's no really wiggle room to. Yeah. Well, I'm going to interpret it in this way. No, you can't. Right. 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 It's it's very clear. Spirago Spirago holds on to that, you know, yeah. but he also incorporates. Uh, in, in, and I'd like to point to one more, you know, one more example. I could I could keep going. Um, there's you know there's there's other examples where you'll see similarities um, between the 92 Catechism and the Council of Trent. And then there's exa there's parts where Spirago goes even deeper, which which I love. Uh, and one of those is, you know, all three of them acknowledge when it's going through the Ten Commandments, you know, all three of them acknowledge uh, St. Augustine's kind of uh, common um, distinction between the uh, between the commandments. You have the first three that relate to our relationship with God, and then the last seven relate to our relationship with with each other. And so there's this kind of... Yeah, and uh, that's kind of well-known. You're teaching yeah. your kids in second grade, the Ten Commandments, and that's pointed out in all the all the curriculum out there. Right, and it's in the 92, it's in the Council of Trent, it's in Spirago as well. But Spirago, he, he goes a little bit further, again, because he's, he's, he's a teacher of souls, he's a pastor of souls. And so he, when, he, when he's looking at the catechism, he says, yes, the first three, and then the last seven. But he, he kind of Picks out the fourth, uh, the the fourth commandment. My favorite commandment, right? Right. Yes. Being a dad of a bunch of kids. Yeah, I remind my kids every night. Then we say the rosary, <laughs> and then I remind them of the fourth commandment, and we go to bed. It's great. Uh, but one of the but so he picks out this fourth commandment, which is honor your father and mother. Right. In case people yeah. don't know. Yeah. Right. So he he picks that out, and he and he kind of puts it in the middle because. Um, parents are God's natural representatives for those children. Wow. And it's and, a bridge. Yeah, it really is a bridge. So, wow. you know, we're, you know, the, 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 the following commandments, you can see them as, yes, those relate to God as well, because they're, res they, they need to, they're respecting God's gifts to creation. They're respecting the other person as a gift from God as well. So we're, but at the, but there's a little bit of a difference. There's a, there's, a, there's something deeper of the relationship between parents and children that Spirago pulls out. And so he really kind of, again, like you said, naturally bridges that together because the first three are directly related to God. The last ones are directly related to each other. But this fourth one, 
right? That there, there is that obedience to parents who, you know, so they are our others, but at the same time, they're not just others, right? There's, there's something distinctive about the, the parents. They're really God's representative in the home, right? I think. And, and again, this goes back to, you know, a, a point where I think Spirago goes a little bit deeper than, than you'll find in these other thing than you'll find in these other catechisms. He goes a little bit deeper to, to highlight a point, which uh, uh, as, a, as both a catechist and a parent, I absolutely love that. Yeah. I love that the way that he's able to do that. No, that's a fantastic example. That, that shows the man has extraordinary insight. And yeah. that's a, probably a great example of why so many well-respected theologians out there and pastors like Father Ripperger, I mean, he promotes this heavily, and he yeah. said, this is the one you need. But not just him, there's many, many more. But that's probably a great example of how he breathes life into something that, you know, guys like you and I say, oh, we know, we, we, yeah. we know this. But then you're able to look at it in a whole new way and from a slightly different angle. And that's what Spirago kind of yeah. brings to it. So, yeah, I got to sit down and read this sucker cover to cover. I do. I mean, I've read chunks, but not <laughs> not all the way through. Well, and one of the things when I was a catechist, I was I was constantly searching for how can I teach this better? Mm -hmm. How can I, how did the saints teach it? How did how did generations before me teach this difficult doctrine? Uh, uh, and so for the catechist, it's it's one more, and I would say very high on my list of resources that I go to uh, uh, when 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 I'm saying okay, how did how did how was this taught in the past? Um, because many times we can have a grasp in our mind, um, but it doesn't come out right, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and 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 sadly, you know, we we the church has suffered tremendously from poor catechesis of lack of clarity, bad methodology, bad tactics, um, all all around watering down of the faith. Uh, what Spirago has done here again, a guy who hated to be boring, yeah, and, and you know, and and was known and was you know called a pioneer of of popular catechesis. Yeah. He's really brought together um, a beautiful catechism that's aimed at conversion, um, that's Christocentric. Uh, and what we've done here with the annotations, I think is we've, we've really created a, a um, not just a tool, but a source for those entering the church and a source for those who want to grow in their faith and, and understand the integrity of the faith, why this is called a statement. It's not a bunch of statements. It's a statement of the mm -hmm. faith. Um, uh, Spirago has done just an absolute uh, marvelous job. So well, that's awesome. And I think Tan's done a great job. I'm really proud of our team. Yeah, it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's, it's a beautiful. beautiful it's a beautiful volume. This is like yeah. a great gift. It looks good on your shelf. It's very sturdy. And I mean, everything from two ribbons, the end sheets are beautiful. And of course, the typesetting and then oh, the yeah. annotations. I mean, it's just kind of a total package. I, it is. We publish a lot of books. And, you know, it's always exciting when we come into the office yeah. and they plop down some of the new <laughs> new publications on your desk and you get to look at it. Yeah. But for some reason, when I got this, I was just like, wow, <laughs> you know, I just kept, wow, <laughs> you know, because I feel like this is like the aircraft carrier of catechesis. <laughs> you know, so many other things we do, yeah. just little planes that fly off and, fly <laughs> off and come back down. But it's a, it's a fantastic product and I really hope it it helps many different segments of yeah. the Catholic marketplace, parents, pastors, catechists, uh, theology students, yeah, you know, so or anybody that's just really trying to dive deep into their faith. So anyway, thanks for explaining all this, Jason. Sure. And, yeah, no. uh, you know, I guess, I guess we'll be seeing you next time, but you're pretty darn good at explaining this. Maybe we'll have to, uh, return and start explaining more of the content itself. Oh, that yeah. would be kind of fun. That would. All right. Awesome. See you next time. All right. Thanks.